Hello, my name's David, and I'm Russell, and welcome to Old News. And it's good to be back at last. Hooray. After a very, very long wait. Long wait. I think we've we've probably said that at the beginning of every episode for a long yeah, time. I guess we should stop beating ourselves up. We have had a good long break, so I think we should consider this the start of season two. Yes. Of the Old News podcast. <laughs> Life has a habit of getting in the way. I hope you haven't missed us too much. It's uh, good to have everybody back on board. Old news. We received a very kind email from a listener. Yes, we did. We? Audience participation. Hooray! Feedback. Uh, yeah, we got an email from Perry in America. Just said kind of how much he enjoys it. He's been listening since we did our little promo on uh, the scathing atheist. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, he particularly liked the one about Hurricane Katrina because he's he grew up on the East Coast, has sort of experienced hurricanes and so on. Yeah. Uh, he did ask me about the beer of indeterminate strength. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Because I, I alarmingly have a bottle that comes from the box that says unknown. <laughs> <laughs> I, however, it's perfectly tasty. But. Yeah, I have a blue top, so it was Belgian triple. Ah. So yeah, the whole thing with the uh, the beer of indeterminate strength is that a couple of years ago, I had a friend who lived with me, a, a sort of housemate. Lodger. Friend, lodger, yeah. that's the right word. Yeah. And to try and save money, he suggested we do a bit of homebrew. The only thing is he got into it. A lot more than I did. <laughs> and not being a massive drinker, I wasn't saving money at all on this deal. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we ended up making gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of beer, which is still sitting in my house. He's moved out. <laughs> and stocks are gradually yeah. dwindling. It's gradually dwindling. But um, yeah, Perry asked whether it was made with like kits or grain or whatever it was kits it was extracts yeah uh tins of gloop as i like to call them <laughs> uh, but they all worked uh we didn't really have one that we had to throw out there was a few that were just on the edge of drinkable yeah didn't you try a cider that was quite unpleasant yeah, well, we tried a few ciders. Yeah. We made a cider out of an actual kit. That was uh, all right. A little bit tasteless, mm-hmm. but it was all right. We did cider made out of just apple juice from a, a box. Right, okay. Carton of apple yeah, juice. Yeah, that didn't really work. No. We did something called toffee apple cider, which had lots of golden syrup in. Oh, yeah. That did work. That's yeah. rather nice. But And for our international listeners, golden syrup is... Uh, a little bit like uh, inverted syrup, which right. you might have heard of, but it's like a, a light coloured molasses. But anyway, go on. Yeah, and, and I suppose we should say it's cider in Britain is always alcoholic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, if it's not alcoholic, it's apple juice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we made some ciders out of silly fruit. <laughs> what was, th- what was we, the one that had, there was really a disaster? All of them, really. It was the pineapple was, one. We made, yeah, pineapple, <laughs> pineapple cider for. S- some reason turns savoury. Yeah, I tried that. That's it was very odd drinking was, a savoury drink. Yeah, not great. Yeah. Prune, <laughs> right. which looked like petrol. No, it did actually no. It looked <laughs> it looked like raw oil, <laughs> crude oil. <laughs> right? Was it drinkable? It of of the stupid side is it, it was the most drinkable. Right, but that. Doesn't really say that was a low bar to jump over. Yeah, it it did all get (laughs) poured down the sink. So we did pineapple. Oh, we did orange cider. Right. That was vile as well. Ooh. That was just so acidic. Yeah. (laughs) But you can recommend the the kits. Yeah. Well, they all have that uh, sort of homebrew tang. Right. Which you just can't get rid of. It. It's something that comes with the 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 canning process. Right. You can't get away from it. I think we minimised it on most of the bees. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Old news. I can't resist doing a little section of old news back in the news. So going right the way back to episode one, we talked about North Korea and the bomb. And of course, as of today, is the start of the summit between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, which is unprecedented. Mm-hmm. 
Well, surely it's very Double presidented because there's yeah. two presidents there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think my personal politics aside, I'm not a great fan of Trump, as I can imagine most of the listeners would discern. Mm. Yet, good luck to him. Mm. Maybe that's what this needs. Maybe it's a bold move to move the show. Who knows? Maybe it's Kim Jong-un's on the point of trying to bring changes. I just have this... <sighs> The conventional wisdom is that we're rewarding somebody for bad behaviour, developing nuclear weapons, letting them go, making big bangs, and then screaming at the top of their voice and firing missiles over the top of Japan, right? That's just, by any stretch, it's bad behaviour. And what's stopping them from reneging on an agreement in six months' time? I just have this terrible feeling that the success will be proclaimed a great success, the biggest success, the best mm-hmm. success, yeah, right? Yeah. In manner of Trump. Mm-hmm. Then in six months' time, the wheels would have fallen off and nothing would have really changed. No. I would just wonder if Kim Jong un, having been brought up in the West, in, you know, he went to school in Switzerland, didn't he? Yeah. You just wonder if he knows about the outside world a little bit better mm-hmm. and maybe wants change, wants improvements. But as far as I can see, the moment he starts to bring change, he'll destabilise his own regime because either the hardliners will want him out or the people will demand more. Uh, more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because they'll start to understand the differences between the economic development in the North and the South. You know, they'll start to see what that means. Yeah. You know, well, even them in China across the border, they're quite successful areas north of the, the Korean border. Maybe this is a good thing. I'm just sort of cautious that the West might, or Trump himself, will end up with egg on his face. Out news. Old news is available on iTunes, Pocket Casts, Player FM, the Apple Podcast app, and all your favourite podcast apps. We're also on TuneIn Radio, and Amazon's Alexa and Google's Assistant can play us just by asking. Technology, yeah. Which is the North East England devolution referendum of 2004. How dry does that it sound? It does sound dry, right? Yes, everybody, it's yet another referendum talk from Britain. Hey, yeah, but <laughs> well, I want to start it with a little bit about like why this particular topic. Because we have made jokes about ourselves being parochial at times, talking about North East England issues. Mm-hmm. But I think this little topic was quite unsexy at the time, has has largely been forgotten, right? So that fills our remit as the old news podcast, okay? But also, it, it just encompasses a load of like abstract debates, which like are important to my personal politics, and I think generally on the whole, like around the world, you know yeah. about government and how government works and whatever and i think someone needs to talk about northeast england <laughs> occasionally because yeah, nobody does yeah 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 you get it, it on tiny t's television and look north on the bbc yeah yeah that's but it that's just like the local news man loses hat yeah you know spokesperson for such and such chamber of commerce said yeah. You know, but I mean, local media is important. The regions do get kind of forgotten about them. They're not sexy and we don't talk about them enough, I think. We're not proud of them enough. I think if you ask people, are you proud to be from the North East? They'll instinctively say, yes, yes, of course, mm. of course they are. But you have to go ask. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard for people to kind of express that. There's no, I don't there's no flag we can get behind, no. which I think is interesting, right? So that's perhaps something we'll talk about. It's old news! Let's talk a little bit about the narrative. So the 4th of November 2004, there was a referendum held in the northeast of England. And the idea was we were going to establish a regional assembly, a re- an elected regional authority, uh, which was, uh, it was driven by John Prescott, mm-hmm. who was deputy prime minister at the time. Uh, can you remember the, the government department he led? 
Oh, it had a ridiculous name. The Department, uh, the Department of, of Local Government Transport and, and the, the Regions. Regions. Yeah, DLTR. Mm -hmm. Which uh, my industry came under DLTR for a little while. Um, there was going to be three regional referenda. There was going to be us in the northeast, uh, the northwest, and also Yorkshire and the Humber. Okay, so we'll just cut to the chase. The result was resoundingly a rejection. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that uh, I wrote it down. Uh, the, yeah. the yes vote was uh, twenty two point one percent. Yeah, and, and the no was seventy seven point nine percent. Yeah, which is just pretty decisive. You know, yeah. when you get that kind of near four to one ratio, <laughs> it's embarrassingly bad, right? I think we should lay our cards on the table. How did you vote? I've got to say I'm struggling to remember, but I do that think something. I do think I voted yes. Yeah, I voted yes as well. But I wasn't, I wasn't wedded to my vote. You were yes, but unenthusiastically. Yeah, I was. Yeah, with no great passion. Right? Mm -hmm. Was I voted yes quite passionately because I thought this is a terrible proposal, but it's a tour in the door for something better. Is that Not uh, independence for Northumbria? Well, the People's Republic of. <laughs> After the failure of this referendum, I did suggest like unilateral declaration of independence, yeah, yeah. and we could install the uh, the Duke of Northumberland as the king, right? And a friend of mine at the time suggested that he would go along with this plan so long as he was appointed the Lord Protector. And I said, well, that's fine, so long as I get the transport minister gig, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so not so much a People's Democratic Republic, then? No. <laughs> More of the royal and ancient kingdom of Northumbria. Yeah, which would be fine, because then we could lay claim to a load of stuff all the way up to Edinburgh. Yeah. And, like, a very small piece of Cornwall. Right, yeah, as okay. well, which yeah, came yeah. under the Northumbrian kings for a long time, so yeah. we could make all kinds of very spurious claims around the world. But no, it, uh, it that obviously wasn't to be. Just to tell the tale about the background, what was going on politically at the time. So we had the referendums for the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament, right, which had been passed. The Welsh won quite narrowly, but it went through Scotland uh, with a healthy majority. There was this thought that power had moved away from London to areas that felt that they were overlooked, mm -hmm. and that the next logical step in that was regional parts of England. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is, for, for those mm. outside of the country... Scotland and Wales now run a lot of their own affairs to varying degrees, while the Parliament in London, which is the UK Parliament, still runs England as well as the whole of the UK. Which means, theoretically, Scottish MPs are voting on laws that only apply in England. Mm. And, and Welsh and, and, Welsh, yeah. and Northern yeah. Irish as well. And, and this question is known as the West Lothian question because of a, an MP called... Uh, oh, Tam... Oh, what was his Something. name again? I've looked to look it up now but he 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 sat in the seat for west lothian and he asked this question years ago about this idea of mps from other areas having more power over england rather than english mps yeah so so therefore you'd think well surely the answer is that england should also have its own parliament hmm. but that brings with it all kinds of other problems like the fact that various different parts of England feel quite disparate yeah. and it would also be vastly more powerful than the Scottish, Welsh or Northern Irish assemblies, assemblies yeah. yeah, because England just has by far the most population, so you can't just say, well give England a parliament but it's he, my, he's, my he's preferred option yeah, personally yeah we could we could and and I think because that idea was knocking round for at the same time I think it was in people's minds well if we are going to do this why can't we have an English parliament because I feel mm -hmm. English yeah um, yeah and that sort of question was never really squared you know like we didn't square the circle there I think the other thing that's easily forgotten as well we had also had the, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland so they ha already had that sort of degree of autonomy we also had the creation of the Greater London Authority as yeah. well so regional devolution in England had already happened mm -hmm. but it had happened in One London 
Yeah. Yeah, in one bit, which obviously London's really important. So you've got the Greater London Authority and the London Mayor. But there was some thought that that was like a, a recreation of what had been the Greater London Council previously. That was something that was abolished under Thatcher, uh, but sort of came came back again in a new form. Old news. So we've got this campaign, got a no campaign led by John Elligan, who is a, a local businessman, not a politician. And his argument was very simple. This thing has no real powers and it'll be Newcastle centric because Newcastle is kind of the big urban area in our region. Uh, and also it'll be quote unquote, a white elephant. Yeah. And there was this figure of £25 million. Pounds. It'll be £25 million pound white elephant. There's that argument of, ooh, spending of money. Yeah. It's bad. That could buy baby monitors. Yeah. We'll always have a demand for more baby monitors, like yeah. how much we spend elsewhere in the economy. Yeah. We could we could collapse the economy by, by spending 100% of GDP on baby monitors. And it still and wouldn't be enough baby it's monitors. Still, yeah, they wouldn't be good enough quality, we'd, right? We'd still have to get baby monitors from Australia and the third world. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or have free movement of baby monitors inside the European <laughs> Union. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I don't know. I, I, I just find those sides of arguments a little bit spurious, right? So there's my own personal politics coming in. But that was a genuine concern that voters had. Voters, I think voters thought, oh, this could be another layer of government which will be demanding lo- a certain level of local taxes. Mm-hmm. Right? I think that probably is the gist of it because they probably looked at some of the some of our local government is terribly patchy. Right? Some of it's really mm-hmm. effective and like despite party politics aside, uh, some of our local government has actually been very good over the long the long term others has blown hot and cold others is just terrible and has been terrible for decades and I think anybody who lives in the North East would be able to guess which authorities I'm talking about here And I, <laughs> I mean we come from Durham which is sort of known as being a bit of a, a rotten borough at times mm-hmm. uh, whereas Gateshead has been very effectively ran for a long time, party politics aside so the Yes campaign is Supported by Labour and the Lib Dems, the No campaign supported by the Tories. Labour support, it, they get a lot of support from the top. So you've got John Prescott, Deputy Prime Minister. You've also got Tony Blair comes in person to mm-hmm. campaign. But the actual Labour Party, it's very watered down. There's very little will for for it. Because the MPs, the local MPs see it as a way of losing power. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, there'll be another authority that's going to take power away from me, which just seems daft because they just you end with a, a Northumberland North question, don't you? Rather than a, <laughs> <laughs> he's there would be voting on powers like in the Midlands or whatever. But anyway, uh, so you've got that. But the Lib Dems are, are only like influential in certain pockets at that point, but they don't have a strong voice. And then you've got so like other people who joined the campaign. I think there was a few of the Chambers of Commerce and one or two other people who were cautiously in favour. Mm-hmm. Like some of the transport groups as well were cautiously in favour. But these were all very small voices. They just The campaign didn't set anybody on fire. No. And you got this enormous rejection because people went, no, right? Yeah. I was just thinking, do you think there's something about it being top-down rather than bottom-up? Because this is the sort of thing that takes off in places when it comes from the people. Yeah. If the campaign for it had started at the bottom. Because there's two things about this, right? The Scottish Constitutional Convention had been sitting for a long time, right? It it had started off as a camp, like a grassroots campaign before it got adopted as like a policy by the Labour Party and under John Smith and all that. It did, it had broad based political support. A lot of the political parties were part of that, um, civil groups and so on. The The case for a Scottish Parliament was built up over years, over decades, mm-hmm. which is why you've got this, as you say, with here, it's a top-down thing. It had been like, there'd been calls for it for a little while, but it was sort of, it was a minority thing. Yeah, It was a minority interest. And it's why the Welsh referendum only just passes. They haven't had that kind of, grassroots building of support over years and years. It's, it only just, say, makes it over the finish line. 
yeah. I think it's a very good question, actually. Yeah. Mm. The other thing which I think people forget going on in the background of this campaign is that it was still very early days of the Scottish Parliament, and by that point, the Scottish Parliament was only famous for doing one thing. I was building a building that was incredibly yeah. expensive yeah, for mm. itself. Yeah. And, I mean, how much money did they throw at that thing? It was like... It was a billion pounds. Yeah, I was just going to say, wasn't it a billion pounds in the end? Yeah, yeah. It, it just massively <clears> overran. <throat> it was a classic public project that just went totally pear-shaped. And, okay, they got a really iconic building out of it. Lots of people don't like it. <laughs> I've never seen it. No, I've seen it from a distance. Not great. But anyway, yeah. I, th- I like the inside when you see the chamber. I think that's really impressive. Right. But the outside, no. Nah take or leave but that had cost a billion pounds of public money Mm -hmm. so it was very easy for the no campaign to point the finger up north and just say well billion pounds do you want to spend a billion pounds yeah yeah on a new build in a new castle yeah we're going to spend a billion pounds and Mm. it's ridiculous yeah and in some ways that held water at the time yeah yeah whereas now right i think people generally have a sense things are done differently in scotland Yes, better NHS, free university. Yeah. Were there any of those policies we agree with or or work or whatever? It doesn't yeah. really matter. We do know that things are done differently. Yeah. And I think people hadn't sort of grasped that that could be the case. But I think that sort of neatly comes into the uh, powers they were expecting to grant this thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I just jotted them down, right? And I think what was really interesting, out of eight powers that I could find listed, four of them are start with the word promotion of. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> not, not actually power, then. not actually development of policy in doing things, but we're just going to promote. Mm-hmm. So we're going to promote economic development. We already had government development corporations for economic yeah. policy. So like why not quangos? Why not just have a series of quangos to do these jobs? Yeah, mm-hmm. promotion of health, safety, and security. I'm sure we're all in favour of that. health, safety, and that security. That sounds like a good yep. idea. Yep. Yeah, a promotion of individual participation in society. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This just seems like broadly good ideas. Yeah. But who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, then the, then there was improvement of availability of was the next four. So you had improvement of the availability of housing. Interesting. So maybe it's building council houses or some sort of planning or variations or, thereof. Yeah, yeah, planning perhaps improving training. Well, it's not like the education authorities. It sounds like duplication, cultural and recreation facilities. Yeah, building parks. Yeah, but, building. But we have a tourist. We have a tourist, tourist quango, don't we? Yeah, yeah tourists uh, visit England and all that. And uh, to protect the environment. And we already have an environment agency. As you could argue that those national bodies, that uh, they would take control, control of like our lo- local aspects. But you just wonder, like, no wonder this didn't set anybody on fire. Because it just sounds like yeah. this is an elected advertising agency. Did you pick up the last power in the list? Oh, the additional duties the Secretary of State thought appropriate. Yeah, I like that one particularly. Yeah. It's like, anything else that I happen to fancy giving you at some point. Anything else which we wish to dump. Yeah. Some sort of statutory duties that London, Westminster can't be bothered with, we're going to dump on you, right? Yeah. Well, some of those are important. But actually, my thinking was, because I'm in favour of, like, taking power from the centre, it was the toe in the door. That gave us the chance to say, can we control this? Yeah. Can we control that? What is disappointing is that transport isn't there in it. Yeah. And, and it's one of the key things. Be, yeah. That would be the biggest thing people would be interested in. Yeah, for sure. If you would like to contact us here at Old News... There are, of course, the usual methods. You can find us on the old-fashioned interwebs at oldnews.podbean.com. You can email us on oldnewspod at gmail.com. We are available on Facebook. Just search for Old News Podcast. And we're also available on Twitter, at Old News Pod. And uh, 
So if you can find us on YouTube, then well done. To add a bit of complication to this whole debate was that the, there was also going to be a reorganisation of the local gov- governments as well. We, where we live, we had two tiers. We had like a, a district and a county. So now we were going to have a regional as well. And we were offered the choice. We were going to eliminate one of those layers. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were offered a whole load of technical choices that I won't bore the listeners with. But essentially all of those were kind of unpopular people yeah. actually quite liked the status quo yeah because they were familiar with it yeah um we were both saying when we were looking into this we voted for different options yeah i voted option b you voted and i option voted a. option a but if there had been an option c of keep the status quo we both would have voted for that yeah, and we would have been therefore happy to have a third tier of government on yeah. top of us. So yeah, one well, here's a thing. That's again, well, it hasn't just popped into my head. I think I was thinking yeah. it yesterday. You're in favour of taking power away from the centre, uh-huh. but what was kind of being offered here was take power away from one centre, but move power up from one layer of localness to make it more of a centre. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And that is a contradiction, Yeah, for sure. Which is where the whole thing about it being Newcastle-centric becomes a problem. Yeah, the fact that people were quite happy with the existing structures leads into kind of my next bit. And it was about sort of, was this always doomed to fail? And I think it was. The example I've got is the old Tynan Weir, so back in the 60s, there was a big reorganisation and they created what was called the Metropolitan Counties. Okay, So this was a totally new creation and it was all of the urban bits in the northeast, Newcastle, Sunderland, formed North Tyneside, formed Tyne and Weir. Okay? And that was a big success in lots of ways. It was quite popular in lots of ways. Mm. Okay, And uh, one of the big things it was really good at was transport. Because yeah. for the first time, there was a joined up authority that kind of covered all of the kind of urbanised area. Right? Excellent. Exactly what we needed. In an ideal world, the regional authority would have been the same thing. That whole urban area plus or the rural bits. The rural and the suburban bits that we come from that surround it, yeah? And that would make sense to have, like, a regional transport authority and, you know. But memories of Tyne and Weir are very long, okay? They were abolished because political reasons, because they were Labour-dominated and the Thatcher government wouldn't have that. Yeah. But I think, secondly, they were... Sunderland always felt it was Newcastle-centric and felt yeah. they got the long end of the stick. yeah. Which yeah. in many ways they or the did. the short end of the stick. Which they did. Yeah. Yeah. And I think memories of that are very, very long in Sunderland. Mm-hmm. And they still remember it, even though Tiny Wee was abolished in, what, the late 80s, early 90s? Yes. Yeah. And, and if that's how Sunderland people think, imagine what someone in Middlesbrough would think. Yeah, who's like the, the third urban area further to the south. Yeah. Quite a lot further to the south. Yeah. Yeah, and considered a bit of a backwater, and people are a little bit patronising towards Middlesbrough. Yeah. So I, for whatever for good we, reason. Well, <laughs> oh, dear, there'll be letters. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Like people get upset about that, and you can see why Middlesbrough just wasn't keen. Places like Darlington had been running their own affairs for a long time, and they saw no reason to because yeah. you know, they had like a separate arrangement. So I think that was doomed to fail because people kind of just remembered what had happened in the 60s and the 70s into the 80s under that system right the the other reason why it's doomed to fail is that i think it's an identity thing and the way i've always framed this is the itv versus bbc debate right because you've got two regional television areas one is the bbc and that's the northeastern cumbria Mm-hmm. in the northwest and ITV is Tang Tees, which is kind of like strictly the northeast down to sort of York isn't it yeah the number of Cumbrians I spoke to which just wailed and went why would you take us with us yeah because they were going to be part of the northwest region yeah 
but they would much rather be part of the North East. They identify with us a lot more. Yeah, because they feel very kind of, they feel Northern in a way that we feel Northern. Yeah. And they're definitely not Scottish. They have that as well, that mm. like we're English but Northern. And the, they, they thought with horror they were going to be sort of included in the same area as Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah, and who's going to be dominant there? Yeah. Yeah. And given that, like, Cumbria is one of the poorest counties in England. England. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, well, in, in the, the UK. In the UK, actually. I think. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's not it's not as poor as Cornwall, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it is bad. And so you can see why they would be really worried about being dominated with a, a city with a very strong identity and be just be, they'd be totally swamped, whereas they felt they would have a better shout alongside places like County Durham that are rural and suburban and Northumberland that are rural and suburban. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That northeast versus northern or northwest versus northern debate was never settled. Yeah. And I think it's interesting how the kind of the identity bit of the northeast like we saw this during the EU ref just recently and I know we've kind of generally stayed away from that debate mm -hmm. but there was a lot of people go. Well, I feel like my identity is being challenged. You know that uh, that was a lot of the politics. There it was like people felt being British or being English was somehow being squashed, or suppressed, mm -hmm. right? Which is fine. My counter argument was always that identity was more complicated than that. And yeah, we can see when we look at the regional identity, it is a complex thing. Mm -hmm. People are quite comfortable with being Geordie or Mackham or fr like from Durham, mm -hmm. Cumbrian. I love how also it's being, from Durham because we just don't have a we don't, name. We don't have a word, right? We're just <laughs> neither fish nor fowl, right? Uh, Middlesbrough, they're called smoggies, aren't yeah. they? That's a bit derogatory. They, they, they haven't quite reclaimed that yet in the way <laughs> yeah. the Mackhams have That's reclaimed clear, clear, Mackham, Mackham yeah. Hood. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Mackham Hood. In Mackham Hood, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The hood in Mackham. Um, and people are comfortable with being from the northeast and from the northwest. People are comfortable with being from the North and being English and being British. It's funny how that kind of complex interlocking rings of identity is perfectly acceptable at that level, but it's not acceptable at the national and supranational level. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This is why I think it's kind of doomed to failure. People just went, oh, the Scottish Parliament are terrible. They've just wasted money glorifying themselves nobody can identify where the north is or where the northeast really is the local reorganization poor options nobody for really particularly one wanted right and the and the powers offered were no good right and here's the thing when you've got no powers you get poor quality candidates yeah and you can guarantee this is what would have happened if we'd elected the authority, right? And despite I'm a supporter, we'd end up with the worst possible candidates yeah. because it wouldn't matter. The powers were so weak. Mm. Whereas if we had transport, people yeah. would be clamoring to, yeah. damn it, I'm going to break the trains for Although, a time. There's a good argument to say we would have just ended up with lots and lots of protest votes, would have just had all the crackpots under the sun. You just have to look at what happened with the mayors well in Doncaster yeah. uh, in Hartlepool yes. Angus the monkey yeah, we got Hangus who turned out actually to be not a bad mayor not. and got re-elected at yeah. least once, possibly twice. Yeah, he got re-elected. Yeah, Stu yeah. Drummond was the yeah. But Whereas the on the basis of a free banana for every school child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whereas, you no. Know, so the joke candidate won that election. Whereas, more seriously, in Doncaster, you had the elected mayor. Again, all these elected mayors came in under Blair under like mm -hmm. a similar set of reforms. It was the English Democrats? who were like a far-right, yeah. slightly unpleasant party, but the only party dedicated to having an English parliament, <laughs> interestingly, right? Yes. Yeah. I've always wondered, like, because they would have elected the, the Assembly under a system of proportional representation. Mm. It was going to be the same as the Scottish or Welsh Assemblies, right. same system, right? And so the North East very heavily dominated by... Labour with a few pockets of opposition here and there. It would have been interesting. We would have permanently had an authority where we had big opposition presences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then, you know, we would have had a, a quote unquote fair revoting system. Yeah. Uh, so I think that would have been interesting just as a thought experiment. What would the North East look like if we had stronger Tory pro business voices or 
you know, stronger liberal voices or green voices, mm-hmm. you know, rather than just being so heavily dominated by one particular party. We'll never know. So I guess, you know, this idea that it would be a toothless talking shop, which was one of the arguments on the no side, held a bit of water. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why it is doomed. Well, didn't you now like pet it old news? Do you think, I think it is, it's an early example of like anti-politics of the kind of Brexit vote. I don't feel strongly the issue, I just want to stick on to the government. Yeah. You no, know, because there was plenty of voters in the Brexit vote that did that. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of people, it's held that like a lot of Trump voters were like, I just want to vote anti-establishment. And you know, like, like the examples you gave, like you know, the mayor in Hartlepool and the mayor in Doncaster. I think this is was an, a good early example of that. The fact that the opposition was led by non-political opposition on a political issue. And it was just the way, like, it's the, again the top-down question you posed earlier. Oh yeah, it's top-down. The government say it's a good idea, so I'm going to vote no. Yeah. Which I think does just doom stuff. I think referenda... Because we don't have a tradition of referenda in Britain. I think Although the, you wouldn't think that, given how much we talk about them on this show. <laughs> that's true. But compared to places like Switzerland, which is like, you know... <laughs> well, that's, every that's week, the one extreme you could go to. Yeah. But also Italy. <laughs> yeah, OK. Let's not forget that. I mean, there's Italy and, you know, say, the United States. Almost every time they have elections, there'll mm. be ballot questions on... No, Down ballot. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of, you know, on certain initiatives. Vote yes uh, to Prop 37. Yeah, exactly, right. I have so, very little idea what any of that means, but there you go. Well, I think it depends which state you're in as yeah. well. So it's like it's the California where a lot of them are kind of grassroots petitions to say we want to enact a certain law. <laughs> and because... You can't get it through the uh, the house. You go through like a popular ballot initiative instead, mm-hmm. and you get X many thousand signatures. Then it goes on to a ballot. So with the next elections, you go yes or no to Proposition Thirty Two or whatever. Yeah. Ee, Henny, it's old news, man. We've been very parochial now, and I wanted to talk a little bit like kind of like the bigger picture issues. Okay, so I, I've I've made an assertion here. Would you agree? The UK is London and southeast centric. Yes. Yes, it is. Like, economically, it's just really imbalanced. Right? Mm-hmm. That's fine. I don't think that's in dispute. Like, how has that come to be the case? 2,000 years of history is is the honest answer. Is, the Romans yeah. set up a city on the biggest estuary where all the goods could come into and where they could control the country from very easily. So access to trade to the continental Europe and all yeah, the rest. That's so the that reason. was always going to be the centre. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so but right because why hasn't it been called like, out? Yeah. Why didn't it like? Yeah. Because you think with industrialization kind of getting going in, in in kind of places like Manchester, Birmingham, the North, mm. uh, with coal and the rest, you know, coal mining and shipbuilding, and whatever. All those old traditional industries we, we used, used to have. I just think that modern economic development being so badly imbalanced is really a function of the beginning of like sort of central planning. And not central planning in the sense of communist command economy, mm. but I think it starts. My my opinion is it starts in the First World War. You know, like the wartime economies, government for the first time really kind of just controlled almost every aspect of the economy. Right, and then that really gets going after the Second World War. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you kind of have that kind of the great plan to build a new Britain after the war, right? And kind of you know the the lay, the Attlee government consensus. You know, and if we, you know, we were going to have a big swathe of the economy would be nationalised and all be centrally planned. We'd have one transport authority to run all transport in all the country. Yeah. You know, which I mean, not been lasted for that long, to be honest. That idea that Westminster was so all powerful was quite new, right? And the good example, which I, I, I come back to in this, is. If you look in pre-First World War Glasgow, if you're a city alderman in Glasgow, you have a say in not only the administrative affairs of Glasgow, the running of the buses and the trams, the running of the water authority, the gas, the electricity, everything that moves, and the business rates and the taxation and whatever. To be a city alderman in Glasgow in in that early industrial era was to be much more powerful than an MP, and you got good quality people. And this was the same in cities like 
Manchester and Birmingham. This is why you get politicians like Chimblin. Uh, yeah. Chimblin, Chimblin, like despite the fact his reputation is trashed because of the Second World War, right? Like, mm-hmm. He comes to power through that kind of experience building or being in control of of a really important local city you know in in charge of all these powers these were these were small states within themselves okay and that is all atomized after the second world war it's just gone those powers are gone and it frustrates me the it seems like the regions and like the regions of england have it worse than scotland i think scotland has found its its feet yeah. And Wales, to an extent, you know, because they have gained more power since they got their assembly. Whereas in in the northeast, before this referendum and since, we still have this thing of we can't do it for ourselves. Why won't government come and save me? Yeah. And yet, not that long ago in history, a hundred years ago, we used to do it for ourselves. Yeah. And, it, and this is what frustrates me. If you're wondering why London is power centric now, it's because they know that that's the attitude. And anybody who's any good in terms of talented public administration and so on, where do they go? They go to London. They go yeah. to London because it's the only place to go to. I think it's interesting when you compare us to America and Canada because they're fed federal systems mm-hmm. and they're very used to having this kind of multi-layered approach old news so there's still a good argument for regional powers and in some way it's happened anyway we just don't have the elected bit okay mm-hmm. so we do have this transport for the north which mm-hmm. is kind of happening uh, whether it it'll disappear again or whatever almost but, certainly yeah almost certainly because of like internal politics certainly central government has recognized that it would make sense at a regional level to have somebody dictate how transport works you know Mm. of course we do have regional mayors and this new regional authority kind of semi being foisted upon people yeah well this is this is the other thing right before this referendum there was a regional assembly yes if he forgets that that was indirectly elected by the local authorities and that it was based it it was a talking shop right Mm. Mm. Talking shops sometimes have to exist because it's useful that if you speak to your neighbours, perhaps. Yeah, you can uh, help each other. Yeah, you can help each other. But the all they wanted to do, really, was to make that from being unelected to directly elected. Mm-hmm. I don't know, think it was like a, a hugely kind of massive reform in a way. But, yeah, we have had this idea of, like, the Northeast Combined Authority yeah. was kind of foisted upon us. And that has collapsed under the weight of the internal politics of the various local authorities. Let's face it, the internal politics of the Labour Party. Well, yeah, the Labour Party in Gateshead in particular, right? Let's point the finger at them. Okay, so there was this opportunity to have some sort of combined authority that would have certain powers, which might have been a good thing, because places like Manchester have made a go of it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, uh, like in the same model that London already has made a go of it. You know, Manchester was given the opportunity, and because of the internal leadership squabbles of one particular political group, it's been shot out of the water. Yeah. The councils north of the town are going to go it alone. Yeah, so they're going to have like a city deal. And there's some thought that we might get like a county deal, quote unquote. I'm doing air quotes on the podcast again. Some of these powers, these regional powers, might come to us anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the direction of travel is heading, maybe heading that direction, whether we have the elected portion or not. Mm. And I, again, I, I just think it's a, a real shame that you know we saw that the Welsh Assembly had less powers than the Scottish Parliament, but since then the Welsh Assembly have become more and more competent, uh, and they have gradually accumulated powers, and they had the second referendum to bring more powers and blah 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 you know yeah. they're they're more now more or less on a par you know? of course the big thing with the welsh assembly is that uh, everybody in north wales thinks they're cardiff centric yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> mm-hmm. but i i guess edinburgh centric in scotland right that's mm-hmm. just always going to be the case mm-hmm. yeah but yeah so i don't i think it's interesting that we fail to have a proper debate then because it just didn't set the world world on fire the turnout was terrible yeah the turnout was 48 percent and given that was a postal vote that's yeah it was awful yeah and usually postal votes increase turnout 
So presumably, like a good chunk of those voters were voters who wouldn't have voted otherwise. Mm. That's so annoying. So we we failed to have a debate. We had our say there, and we kicked it into touch. But policies moving that direction anyway of bringing powers regionally in mm. one form or the other. Mm-hmm. But now we just don't have any structure. It's going to be kind of piecemeal bits up. and pieces. Piecemeal, yeah. yeah. It's going to be typically British. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, I just think King Arthur will come back and save us. I don't know where that came from. Sorry. Why must we accept the tyranny of this uh, of this <laughs> Wessex king? I'm, I'm sure the Mercians would have something to say about this. And we in Northumbria... What are the Mercian collaborators? <laughs> Make Mercia great again. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I, we we have totally lost all of our American listenership with this episode. <laughs> but I do wonder. I was just thinking about this. How much of that kind of you know, the old Anglo-Saxon kingdoms? How much of that identity still exists? Because mm. you know, apparently there is a thing in Kent uh, where that divides. It's like it's east and west between Kentish men and men of Kent. Yes, and this is this is like people very strongly identify with those two and this is like one of these ancient Saxon borders that for uh-huh. some reason still, still has exists. relevance yeah. you know I think if if you were to describe us as Northumbrian in the north it would people would kind of go along with it a little bit yeah. kind of funny they would laugh at it but go yeah, yeah we're kind of Northumbrian aren't we hmm. but things like Mercia I don't know, we have like East Mercia Police and West Mercia Police, don't we? Mm -hmm. That sort of exists as a name, but I don't see many people like campaigning for Mercian rights. Because the borders are very indefined. Whereas for Northumbria, you can say, you know, freedom from the Humber to the Tweed. Yeah. The the borders for Mercia. Oh, we've got a slogan now as well. How many excellent. Is this sedition? I think we might. I think we could very easily be uh, uh, prosecuted for being seditious at this point. Freedom from Offers Dyke to the Wash. (laughs) We should definitely just sort of make claims on places to the south of us and say, you know. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we've got all kinds of claims. There's that bit of. It's Lincolnshire that was on and off part of Northumbria. Oh yeah, yeah, we can definitely claim yeah, that. That's, that bit. Yeah, yeah. But See, the problem point, is, if we're going to go along with this, then we're going to get Strathclyde can be out. Yeah, as well. I'm going to say there's yeah. going to be the kingdom of Strathclyde, but doesn't that also include Cumbria and part of like Liverpool yeah. and North Wales as well? Yeah, yeah, isn't that sort of kingdom of Strathclyde? Well, they were Britons, you know. We we can just have them anyway. <laughs> They've been pushed to the edges. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the thing, Filthy right? Celts. Right, right. <laughs> Right, because we're that's trying. getting cut out. <laughs> I'm not calling people filthy cows. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? So you've got like the ancient Britons and the Anglo Saxons, right? And yet, for many hundreds of years, we were under Danish rule. So yeah. why no reestablish the Dane law? Yeah, that's a good idea. Because that that would include Cumbria. It would include us all all the way down the east of England. Yeah, plus then, Denmark, Norway. <laughs> Right, and we, and we everybody always agrees all oh, the Nordic countries are great are places best. to live to live in. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Why don't we just declare independence as the Dane law, then apply to join the uh, the Nordic Council? Yeah, yeah, that's the way. Or, it or is. the Kingdom of Denmark. No, no, well, I don't oh, think right. it's it about the Dane again. Yeah, it's an independent I mean, kingdom within the Nordic Council. Well, I don't mind having dominion status. Like, we would be like a new Canada to Denmark, if that makes sense. Oh, you know, like, like a new Greenland to Denmark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, impractical international suggestions. <laughs> Has not Scotland applied to join the Nordic Council before? I think they have, yeah. yeah I think they have some sort of... Do they have observer status or something? As usual, would like to thank Peter Kitson, Haley, Stephen and Eddie N for the use of their voices and bensound.com for the use of the royalty free music. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>